This is DW News live from Berlin. A special tribute to Germany's departing Chancellor. Angela Merkel is stepping down after 16 years in office and she's being honoured tonight with a grand military tattoo. We'll bring the ceremony to you live. But Chancellor Merkel hasn't stopped working yet. Tonight she announced tighter restrictions to try and break a winter wave of COVID-19. Unvaccinated people will be banned from leisure sites and non-essential shops, and all German residents could be required to get vaccinated from February. I'm Phil Gale. Welcome to the programme. Germany's outgoing Chancellor Angela Merkel officially hands over power next week, but this evening she'll be played out of office with a ceremony on the parade ground outside the Defence Ministry a building here in Berlin. A parade of this kind is the highest honour Germany's armed forces can bestow on a civilian. Uh, there will be a torchlit parade and a military brass band will play uh, three songs handpicked by the Chancellor. One of those songs is by punk artist Nina Hagen, which raised a few eyebrows. The event will start with the uh, Chancellor's uh, farewell speech. Uh, that'll be in a few minutes. Ahead of that, let's take a look at the Merkel legacy. Angela Merkel has been in power so long that a whole generation of Germans has grown up knowing no other Chancellor. Over 16 years in office, she's also become something of an icon. She was the woman in charge, and this is how she's going to be remembered, wearing that conservative trouser suit with that signature hand gesture. The Chancellor won respect on the world stage, keeping her trademark calm as she went toe-to-toe -to -toe with unpredictable leaders. At home, she's been seen as stable and capable, and she leaves Germany and Europe. Uh, um, and as she leaves, Germany and Europe are losing their most experienced crisis manager. Angela Merkel, controlled, stable, giving away nothing. Over the past 16 years, she created her own brand of stability politics, rooted in science and her original definition of what it's all about. To me, politics is service for the people, for those who elect a politician. Aged 51, Angela Merkel became Germany's first woman chancellor. So help me God. Immediately, she raised the alarm over climate change as a threat to humanity. But she would fail to meet her own climate ambitions. Like most of the world's most powerful leaders, she prodded into action. Soon, events would demand Merkel's focus, and her forte became managing crises. The collapse of Lehman Brothers in 2008 and the Euro crisis that followed saw Merkel's stability politics survive a baptism of fire. Her word was enough to calm the nerves of German savers. And we tell all savers that their funds are safe. The government will make sure of that. But forcing austerity on Greece and other countries also sparked hostility and fear. In Merkel's eyes, the role of the chancellery was above all to provide stability. And with each passing year, more people would take her name to mean just that. Her legacy is defined by a key event in 2015, when large groups of mostly Syrian refugees risked their lives to come to Europe. Merkel left the German borders open. Around a million people came to Germany. She insisted failure to integrate them was not an option. We manage many things, we'll manage this. While she was hailed abroad for her open arms policy, at home she was targeted by right-wing populists who chanted, Merkel muss weg, Merkel must go. <laughs> to this day, Europe lacks a common asylum policy. Merkel's plan to focus on Europe in her final year was derailed by the COVID-19 pandemic. A scientist herself, she did not hesitate to accept the magnitude of the threat. It is serious. Take it seriously. Germany went into an immediate but light lockdown. 
Merkel also crossed one of her longest standing red lines. She dropped her resistance to EU direct debt, leaving German taxpayers standing in for other European countries. In her exclusive legacy interview with DW, she said this was one of her toughest moments. The two events I personally found most challenging were, for one, the large number of refugees arriving here, and now there's the COVID-19 pandemic. And those are perhaps the ones where you could see people directly affected, where people's fates were at stake. That, for me, was the most challenging. After 16 years as chancellor, the brand of stability politics Angela Merkel created will remain a reference point for leaders around the world. Well, here to talk us through tonight's events is DW Chief Political Correspondent and keen Merkel watcher, Melinda Crane. Welcome, Melinda. So what can we expect from tonight's Zapfenstreich? Well, as we heard, this is the very highest military honor that Germany has. And it is a musical affair. Uh, it involves uh, torches. Uh, the Zapfen is, uh, is essentially a torch. In other words, it is a torch uh, parade. And it takes place at a site of great historical significance for Germany, at the Bendler Block, which is essentially... You can just see pictures uh, on the screen now. Indeed, uh, indeed, there we see it. Uh, the site of the German military, but the site also of abuses uh, during the Nazi era. So a place of historical significance. And as you know, Germany does not have an untroubled relationship to its army uh, for um, historical reasons. So the Zapfenstreich, this, uh, this ceremony that we are about to see, is not uncontroversial and yet past proposals that it perhaps is time uh, to to end these ceremonies have never been taken up because it is an event of great uh, of great historic and emotional significance for many many people in Germany and I have no doubt whatsoever that that will be the case this evening as well and so who gets a Zapfenstreich Retiring chancellors, uh, the predecessor of Angela Merkel, Gerhard Schröder, also had one other major public figures, military figures, and so on. And what's involved is essentially there are invited guests in in this case, uh, yes, and of course the president also uh, receives one when his time uh, in office ends. And this is an, an event where there will be event, uh, invited guests, but not many. The numbers have been greatly limited and they will in fact, be confined to people who can show that they are vaccinated, have recovered, and, uh, and or are, uh, are presenting a test. In addition, uh, besides them, there will be the military band, and it will be playing musical choices that Angela Merkel uh, proposed, and that uh, for some people were rather surprising, and that indicates some humor. Um, and have uh, have something to say about her own background. Mm -hmm. And besides that, we will also hear her speak, but very, very briefly. She will speak only for seven minutes at the start of the proceedings. And, and as you say, this 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 um, this Zapfenstreich has a, has a long uh, history in, in this country. Um, do you think this is going to have a particular meaning for Angela Merkel? I think it will. Angela Merkel is not given to pathos, and we should not expect that we will hear a lot of pathos in her remarks. She has really downplayed all of her last uh, visits, farewell words, and so on. Her final She's press... She's all about business as usual. Yeah, her final press conference was a pretty subdued, restrained affair. Nonetheless, I think this absolutely will be significant uh, for her, and one sign of that is that one of the three musical choices she's asked for is a hymn, and uh, it's a hymn that is entitled uh, uh, We Praise the uh, uh, Great Lord. And, uh, and I think that also tells us something not only about her own personal background, but about her thankfulness, which I'm sure that we will be hearing about also in her remarks. Okay, so even though this is the sort of the formal farewell, she doesn't actually leave office today. So talk us uh, through how the, the, the handover of power works. That's correct. The actual handover of power occurs when the parliament elects 
the new uh, the new chancellor. He is, of course, th at this moment, the chancellor in waiting. The coalition is formed. The coalition agreement is signed. Nonetheless, he has not taken office. Angela Merkel tonight is still the caretaker uh, head of government in Germany. But next week, the parliament will meet to then vote in the new government. And at that time, that is then the final handover of power from Chancellor Merkel to the man who has been her finance minister in the outgoing government, a man she knows very, very well and uh, with whom she sat today as they decided on uh, the newest uh, corona restrictions and, uh, and vaccination uh, uh, campaign going forward. All right, we're going to talk about that uh, now. So for, for now, uh, Melinda Crane, thank you so much. Uh, those events due to begin in the next uh, few minutes and we'll bring those to you live here on DW. As Melinda was saying, today, not just about ceremony for the Chancellor. Uh, earlier, she announced uh, new measures aimed at controlling the country's fourth wave of COVID-19 infections. Under the new rules, unvaccinated people will be banned from leisure facilities and non-essential shops. Uh, nightclubs in areas with high infection rates will also have to close. And a general vaccine mandate could come into effect in February. We'll hear from Angela Merkel first and then from her designated successor, Olaf Scholz. Our discussions today are taking place against the background of the situation our country is in. And it is a serious one in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. Hospitals are reaching the limit of their response capacity, and we can see this in the fact that patients are being relocated. And this is why we've been talking about the need for solidarity nationwide and the need to bring down the number of infections and not overstretch our public health system, but rather ease the pressure on it. We find ourselves in a very difficult situation, as everyone is aware of. This has to do with the fact that while we have a lot of vaccinated citizens in this country, there are not enough of them to ensure that we don't have yet another wave of infections sweeping through the country. This is a situation we find ourselves confronted with, and it's clear what we must do. First, those who have not yet decided to get vaccinated need to decide to do it now. And this is my personal appeal that we try to convince everyone that hasn't had a vaccination yet to go and get one. It's so important, and we know that there is a real consequence of the fact that many have not yet had a vaccination. If that were to change, that would be very important. For me personally, it's something linked closely to a lot of emotion because we know all too well the situations that we are experiencing in the ICUs, how hard this is making the lives of the nurses and doctors who are working in intensive care units. Because there are many people who have not yet been vaccinated who are fighting for their lives in the ICUs. Olaf Scholz, Germany's Chancellor designate. Let's get more from DW's chief political correspondent, Michaela Kufner, who was uh, there. Uh, welcome, Michaela. So we have the, the, the Chancellor and the Chancellor uh, designate very much with, the, with vaccinations and the unvaccinated in their sights. Absolutely. Uh, this is something that both have come forward. They would like to see the Bundestag German Parliament vote on this. And also MPs have been told by several parties that they do not have to vote uh, um, along party lines. But what we saw here today is as close as we are probably going to ever get to the incoming government admitting that they simply weren't up to speed when it came to tackling the fourth wave. And this is now an increasingly desperate attempt to stop that wave, which is slightly slowing. And here in the document that I have, it says um, that the lawmakers will be asked to extend the catalogue of potential measures under the current law that was just introduced by the incoming government of Olaf Scholz and to extend measures that were implemented previously by the previous Merkel government um, beyond the 15th of December deadline. So this is all sides pulling together, trying to keep face and implementing tough, strict new measures. Right. Strict new measures, but no lockdown yet. Despite that, this is going to hit business hard. Um, what was said about compensation? 
Well, uh, certainly Olaf Scholz, who put the bazooka on the table. We all remember that during that first wave, uh, freeing billions of euros in compensation, left that prospect open for today. Um, but there are no guarantees for compensation. We've heard from representatives um, of the uh, Shops Association here in Germany saying that a 2G regulation, only letting people into shops who are either recovered from COVID or have been double vaccinated would be a complete disaster for Christmas shoppers, although essential shops like supermarkets remain open for all. Also, many cultural events face new restrictions. Um, also, a maximum number of 5,000 people who can gather in private, 50 people also under 2G regulation. So this stops short of an all-out lockdown, but it does take big steps toward that. All right, thank you for that, uh, DW Chief Political Editor, Michaela Kufner. This is uh, DW, a special programme as we uh, return to our main story. And we're looking at the special farewell honours uh, for departing uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Um, you're looking at live uh, pictures from in front of the Defence Ministry uh, here in Berlin. Uh, that's the parade ground there. Uh, and a parade of this kind is considered the highest honour the German armed forces can bestow on a civilian. So we're going to see a, a torch-lit parade and a military marching band will play some of the Chancellor's hand-picked favourite songs. We'll also hear from uh, the lady herself as she gives her farewell speech at the start of proceedings. Now, one of the things that uh, Angela Merkel is likely to be remembered for is her decision in 2015 not to close Germany's borders to hundreds of thousands of refugees. One of those who arrived that year was an 18-year-old Syrian, Anas Modamni. He achieved a sort of fame after taking a selfie with the Chancellor. Six years on, DW caught up with him at his new home in Berlin. Today, Syrian Anas Modamani lives in the east of Germany's capital, Berlin, in his own apartment. Six years ago, he was staying in temporary housing for refugees. He's accomplished a lot since those days. I'm studying business communication. I'm in my fifth semester. I'm working too, and I live together with my girlfriend, and I hope I'll be able to gain German citizenship later. Modamani already has an appointment with the naturalization office. Perhaps his famous selfie with Angela Merkel has helped him here too. The selfie with the Chancellor means a lot to me. It's more than just a picture. It's a symbol of the humanity of Mrs. Merkel. She helped me and with that saved my life. I will be grateful for the rest of my life. The selfie was a proof of how big her heart is, that she took us in, gave us the opportunity to stay here and helped us integrate well into the country. Because of the selfie, a German host family came forward in 2015 to take in Modamani. But still, things weren't easy. After the terror attacks in Brussels and Berlin, posts on social media claimed he was the attacker. He feared for his life. And Modamani sued Facebook and demanded the deletion of the false reports, but without success. Today, he's put that behind him, and Angela Merkel remains his personal hero. I will miss her very, very much. If I would meet her again, I would really thank her for how much good she has done for me. Because of her, I'm doing much better today, and I want to show the respect I have for her. She is such an incredible person who saved my life. And maybe after that, I would ask her to take a new selfie with me. And because Anas Modamani has had the best experience with selfies, here's one more from our team. Well, DW's chief political correspondent, Belinda Crane, is here to guide us through uh, tonight's events as uh, Angela Merkel gets her ceremonial uh, farewell. That's uh, happening in a few minutes. You see in the little box beside me there, that's the, uh, the scene outside uh, the uh, German Defence Ministry parade ground where tonight's events will take place uh, in the next uh, five or ten minutes, we hope. Um, as we wait for that, uh, Belinda Crane, let's talk about the, the, the 2015 um, refugee uh, crisis. This was a big, bold gesture from uh, Angela Merkel. Um, did that come to sort of uh, to, to dominate what has become her political legacy? 
It looks like it would. I think ultimately, uh, no, it is now one of many crises that ultimately she did manage to, uh, to cope with pretty successfully. Um, if we look back to that time, if you remember, thousands of refugees were essentially stranded on Germany's southern border, uh, unable to go forward, unable to go back. And under those circumstances, she did make the decision to open the border, as we just heard. Now, Many people at the time, or some people, particularly uh, those who were opposed uh, to a new wave of immigration, people on the right wing in Germany, said that the decision to open the border itself was a major mistake. I do not see it that way, but it was a mistake not to consult more closely with other members of the EU at the time, with some of Germany's closest neighbours and allies. Just to interrupt you there, because uh, we can see that the, the Chancellor is actually uh, arriving uh, at the uh, Zapfenstrang. We just saw the, uh, the pictures. There she is. She's uh, on her way in. Uh, and you say this is this is a building with uh, historical uh, resonance in Germany. Deep, deep historical resonance. This is the headquarters of Germany's military, but it was also the headquarters of Germany's military during the Second World War. In other words, of the Nazi uh, of the Nazi uh, army, and it is also the place where the German uh, resistance who attempted to foment a coup against. Hitler were executed in the night of July 20th, 1944. So it has enormous historic and emotional significance for Germany. And, uh, and this, of course, is another moment of great historical Let's meaning. Let's hear from the lady herself. Sehr geehrter Herr Bundespräsident, sehr geehrte Frau Bundestagspräsidentin, Exzellenzen, German President, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, fellow country, men and women. Standing here in front of you today gives me a deep sense of gratitude and humility. Humility before the office that I have held so long. Gratitude for the confidence that you placed in me. A trust that I am well aware is the most important capital in politics, and it is absolutely not something you can take for granted. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I want to thank you, Minister Annegret, and the German Armed Forces for organizing this ceremonial farewell with the military, and that in the Bendler block location as well. I want to thank the military band as well, who will be playing, and that in the difficult situation of the pandemic. I also want to remember all of those who have done everything they can and continue to do so to stem the tide of the pandemic, to curb it, the physicians, the nurses in the hospitals, the vaccination teams, the helping hands in the German Armed Forces, the Bundeswehr, and in all of the charity organizations as well. We owe them our gratitude. I am very grateful to them. Today, I spoke to the leaders of the federal states and with other members of the government in another pandemic debate. And here, a few hours later, after 16 years, I am taking farewell from all of you as German Chancellor. And I think this sequence of events today shows you the kind of times we are living in at the moment. 16 years as Chancellor of Germany were full of events, often very challenging politically, and as a human being, they challenged me. But at the same time, it was a deeply satisfying position. Particularly the last two years of the pandemic have shown me in no uncertain terms just how important trust in politicians, in science, and in public discourse in society is, but also just how fragile those things can be. Our democracy lives from the capacity to engage critically with ideas and to correct its path. And it lives from balancing out the respect 
respect that we have for one another and the interest that we have for one another is based on solidarity and trust and also trusting in facts and trusting that wherever scientific understanding is denied and conspiracy theories are, fought, are pursued and incitement to hatred is pursued, that these things will be contested. Our democracy lives from, so that whenever hatred and might are used to assert ourselves, our tolerance as Democrats finds its limit. The many challenges within Germany are also seen in our, what's going on in the rest of the world as well, and not just since the pandemic, because the financial and economic crisis in 2008 and the many people who fled their homes in 2015 have shown how important it is that we work together across national borders, how crucial international institutions and multilateral instruments are in order to tackle the main challenges of our day together. Climate change, digitization, people fleeing their homes, migrations. I would like to encourage you in the future to look at the world from other people's perspectives as well, to perceive the perspectives that the person next to you has, even if it's very different but always to pursue justice. Ladies and gentlemen, my political work would not have been possible without the support of political compatriots nationally and internationally. And I thank all of them. I thank the colleagues of mine in the German government, in the German parliament, in the upper and lower houses of parliament for our good cooperation. I also want to thank you for a political culture of frank conflict and discussion that many other countries envy us for. And I very much thank my closest supporters who have worked with me in my team. And I also want to thank my family. And now it will be down to the next government to find answers for the challenges facing us and to shape our future moving forward. Olaf Scholz and the government you will lead, I wish all the very best, much success in every way, and may things come easily to you. I am convinced that we will be able to continue to shape the future well if we do not encounter one another with distrust, with pessimism, but rather, as I said three years ago, in a different context, with a light heart and engaging with our work that way. That is what I have tried to do in my life in East Germany and certainly and all the more once I had achieved freedom. It is taking things with a light heart that I wish all of us and our country as well for the future. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Angela Merkel giving her a farewell speech from the uh, parade ground in front of the German Defence uh, Ministry building. Uh, Melinda Crane, um, lots of thank yous and uh, some, some interesting points raised there. Indeed. Uh, and uh, as we said, not a lot of pathos, uh, but some earnestness, uh, for example, when she talked about the challenges to democracy and the importance of uh, building trust and her own recognition of the important role that trust plays over the course of the past two years of the pandemic. Also, her words about uh, encouraging everyone to look at the world from others' perspective, to try to take a different view of things. And then that final injunction to approach things with a lightness of heart. And I think what she doesn't mean is, you know, that we should take things uh, as fun, but that we essentially should be optimistic and, um, and look to what we can do uh, in cooperation with others. And the, uh, the Anne Egret that she, she mentioned uh, in her speech there, sitting next to the German defense minister and former 
uh, Merkel protégé, uh, Annegret Kramp, uh, Kramp, 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 uh, And so now we start with the torches. Indeed. As we said, this is a traditional German military honor. It has a very long history. It is not uncontroversial in Germany. And yet it is very much an accepted way of uh, a, an accepted ceremony with which this country does mark important occasions like the stepping down of a chancellor, of a president, of a major uh, military officer. Now, we're told that some of the musical choices that Chancellor had, we are right now hearing an introductory march, but that some of the choices she uh, uh, expressed in terms of her musical wishes required very hard work from this band because they were not in their normal repertoire. Indeed, some of them had to be transposed to be played by this band. So you can be sure that they have been prepping very hard for this moment. Zapfenstreich, richt euch! Augen gerade, aus! Fackel! Das Gewehr über. Achte, präsentiert das Gewehr. Zur Meldung. Augen rechts. Frau Bundeskanzlerin, ich melde großer Zapfenstreich zu Ihren Ehren angetreten. Frau Bundeskanzlerin, 
Anlässlich des großen Zapfenschreis zu Ihren Ehren überreiche ich Ihnen die Urkunde des Pass on the certificate of the Ministry of Defense as part of our ceremonial farewell. Augen gerade auf, das Gewehr üben. Gewehr ab. Großer Zapfenstreich. Rück. Serenade. by an East German singer. Of course, she is not uh, singing, but this dates back to Angela Merkel's youth in Eastern Germany. And interestingly enough, the name of this song uh, translated is You Forgot the Color Film. And the, uh, the words of the song, the refrain, essentially uh, are a girl telling her boyfriend that although they've just had a lovely week at the beach, the fact is that he forgot the color film and therefore no one will know what a lovely time they truly had and that everyone will see their pictures only in black and white. And it's often thought to be, uh, to be a song that addresses the perception that life in the former East Germany was colorless but in fact that it was a very colorful life indeed. And Angela Merkel hearing a song uh, entitled, translated, uh, Let It Rain Red Roses on Me. And 
uncharacteristically romantic, you might say, for Angela Merkel, but I think there's more than a trace of humor in her choice of this song, because as we could hear from her own remarks, it actually is never about her. Again, an absolute classic there. Um, goes a long way back to Angela Merkel's youth. And we did see a little smile playing there at, uh, at the corners of her mouth. She's keeping an absolute poker face, but I think uh, we can assume that she will have been both amused and moved.
And that was the hymn, Great God, We Praise Thee. And I think the significance of that is both the fact that she does come from a religious family. Her father was a pastor in Eastern Germany and also her gratitude and thankfulness that she expressed in her remarks. She talked about feeling satisfied uh, with uh, the, her time in office. And uh, I, I think uh, this hymn of praise very much signifies that. Großer Zapfenstreich, Stück. Großer Zapfenstreich.
helm ab zum gebet Helm auf Das Gewehr über. Achtung, pressen Sie das Gewehr.
the German national uh, anthem uh, playing us uh, out there. You've been watching the, the Grosser okay. Zapfenstreich, the uh, grand military tattoo performed by the German armed forces in honour of departing Chancellor uh, Angela Merkel. Uh, still in office until uh, next week, but this is her formal send-off. Ongerade aus. Das Gewehr über. Gewehr ab. Fackelträger. Dünnstein. Fackelträger. Rechts und links. Um. Fackelträger. Ma. Zapfenstreich.
watching DW and we've been watching the Grosser Zapfenstreich, the grand military tattoo performed by the German armed forces in honour of departing uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel. Uh, DW's chief political editor, Michaela Kufner, another keen Merkel observer, is actually uh, there uh, for us. Uh, we weren't allowed to uh, bring cameras there because of COVID-19 restrictions, so she joins us on the line. Uh, welcome, Michaela. What's it like there? Well, most of all, it's cold, but this certainly was a very dignified farewell to, to just hear the applause there from dozens of former cabinet ministers, because that's how many Angela Merkel amassed over 16 years of being in government. And uh, she's surrounded by her family. She now faces the crowd, a, a slight bow, probably the most emotional we've seen her throughout, because this is a very much choreographed affair and now Angela Merkel starts greeting people getting a bit more personal now before she will actually be leaving here in an official car so um, the most official the most dignified of many farewells that we continue to see over days and probably weeks and as you say, a very uh, well. I mean, she's not hugely emotional, but as you say, the, the, this is not a woman who is who is prone to, as you might say, wearing her heart on on her sleeve. So I'm guessing after 16 uh, years, it's 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 okay to let a, a little bit of you seep out. There she is, um, just smiling to the crowd. Yes, and, and quite a crowd this is, um, because also there are Olaf Scholz, their current vice chancellor. Um, future members of the government, Annalena Baerbock, the Green co-leader, um, Harbeck, her colleague, who will be get uh, a super climate uh, and economics ministry. So it really is a moment at the crossroads of the handover um, before we see the election of the new chancellor in the coming week in the German Bundestag. Um, but many people who were with her along the way here today, at the same time, very exclusive crowds. A little wave as she as she moves uh, off there. And uh, over the years of um, uh, of the 16 years of her reign as uh, chancellor, you followed her uh, closely, um, and have encountered her uh, in person. Yes, and and I have to say, the first time I actually got to go with her on her official plane and. There's a small briefing room and she was sitting there in a cardigan and she looked basically like a middle-aged woman in a cardigan. I thought, oh, wow, it's Angela Merkel and <laughs> she's sitting here in a cardigan. It, it was a bit unusual because she'd already created this brand of stability politics of hers. But I've also seen her interact with people um, very personally and she, she does like to share a joke. She once accused us journalists that you can't have a proper joke with us because we will go and tell everybody, which is true because that's what we do. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I know from people, her, her advisors close to her, that you know she does like to have a good laugh and uh, she does like to have one, two glasses of wine after very long days. And she did have very punishing um, uh, days indeed. That's how she liked to have them condense everything together, but always exchange views with people. And that's also what we heard in her speech today. You have to, we, sh we need to look at things through each other's eyes, she said. Um, this is uh, the, the straight thinker, Angela Merkel, the scientist who said that that is where tolerance of uh, democratic societies is reached, where people don't accept facts anymore. Yes, that is Angela Merkel when you see her one-to-one. -one, and she, of course, had leading scientists, Mr. Drosten, who's like Germany's Dr. Fauci here as well today, making the point that facts are what matter to her both as a public figure but also in private. She always likes to get the facts together. Right. And, and over that 16 years, as I say, you've examined her closely. Are you going to miss her? <sighs> um, look, there's no term limit in Germany. I used to be an election observer as well. I think even people who, who dis totally disagree with her say she has such an intellect and such an understanding of facts. And that, I think, um, does deserve a lot of respect from everybody. At the same time, one hallmark of democracy is change. 
And what I've seen here today as well is also a crowd that is ready for that. And certainly Angela Merkel herself seems ready for that as well, to become a private person again. Okay. Thank you so much for uh, joining us, giving your uh, thoughts from uh, down there at the uh, German Defence Ministry, where tonight's uh, event has taken place. Michaela Kufner, DW Chief Political Editor. Uh, DW Chief Political Correspondent uh, is uh, still here with me, uh, Melinda Crane. Let's start on, on that, that personal uh, note, Melinda. Are you going to miss uh, Angela Merkel? There are definitely qualities that she has that I will miss. Perhaps her successor will have some of those qualities as well, but her modesty, her restraint, her enormous personal integrity, I think people in Germany sometimes take it for granted, but the sense that she is absolutely incorruptible and that the blandishments of power and, and material success really don't matter to her. That's not the case uh, with all leaders, even leaders in democratic countries. And those are things that I think I will definitely miss. I think her steadiness in a crisis, uh, her pragmatism, her ability to do plain talking when it's needed. Uh, if you remember at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, when she gave some of her speeches uh, to German citizens, she told them things as basic as, you know, how to well wash their hands well. And I, I think uh, she's often almost appreciated more abroad than at home for some of those qualities. As you may remember, she uh, received uh, an academic distinction in the U.S. Uh, this past summer for her communication, her crisis communication. And um, there's one other quality, and maybe I'll just relate my own little personal uh, encounter with Merkel. At the very start of her national political career, on the evening that she had been chosen chancellor candidate by her party in 2000. And five, I was invited to a large dinner, uh, and she had also been invited. Nobody thought she would come, but she showed up wearing the same clothes we'd seen her in on television. And I wound up being seated at her table, and we were talking, uh, several of us, about the uh, Iraq war, the post-Iraq war situation. And I mentioned a famous book entitled uh, Europeans Are From Venus, and Americans are from Mars. And she asked for a piece of paper and a pen and wrote down that title. Now, first of all, she was listening. Second of all, she was interested in the facts, uh, as we just heard Michaela say, and as the chancellor said in her own remarks this evening, facts matter, and she wanted to know more about the facts. Now, most people in a position of power on the night they're chosen candidate, they might say, could you please give that title to my mm -hmm. assistant? She took out a note and wrote it down herself. And I found that quite impressive. And we, we saw her get a, a drive off uh, in the, the, the back of the, uh, her official car there. Um, what does the future um, hold for her? Uh, did, she's leaving politics, is she, completely? She's been pay playing her cards very close to the vest. But in fact, I don't think she's keeping a big secret. I think she truly doesn't know yet exactly what path she'll go down. She has said she does not plan to continue in politics. There'd always been a great deal of talk about, well, maybe she'll take an international position. She has more or less ruled that out. But over in, uh, in our parliamentary studio, we've been doing a bit of research uh, and uh, trying to figure out at least what kind of auctions might be open to her. So maybe let's take a look at that report. What exactly Angela Merkel sees when she looks into the future, she's not saying. After 16 years at the helm, she'll finally have time to relax and pursue her hobbies. But what form will that take? In Berlin, there's been plenty of speculation about Merkel's plans for life after retirement. She'll take on honorary positions, become chairman of a foundation somewhere. First, Merkel should write her autobiography, 10 volumes. That would be my wish, and I would definitely read it. After they do something remarkable, like win the Super Bowl, they go to Disneyland. She'll go hiking, cook, she loves potato soup. As chancellor, Angela Merkel saw many heads of state come and go. Each of them found their own path following the end of their active political careers. Some stayed in politics. Others 
simply stayed in the headlines. Merkel's predecessor, Gerhard Schröder, decided to take up a new profession as lobbyist for the Russian oil giant Gazprom. The socialist Antonio Guterres served as prime minister of Portugal, then went international. Today, he's secretary general of the United Nations. Former U.S. President Barack Obama travels around the globe, holds lectures, and writes memoirs. Merkel most likely won't take up the pen or hit the keyboard. Former chancellors are required by law to maintain silence on state matters. She's not letting on what she'll do instead. I've said I want to get a bit of rest, and then we'll see what comes to mind. But I will no longer be involved in politics. But no one can really imagine that Angela Merkel will refrain from taking on any official position whatsoever. Not least because, as former head of government, she's going to be very well equipped for other work. <laughs> As Chancellor, Angela Merkel earned a salary of 25,000 euros a month. Three months after she leaves office, that sum will drop to 15,000. She'll be entitled to security protection and an official car with driver until the end of her life, as well as an office in the Bundestag, including an office administrator and three staff members. Angela Merkel's been using her last weeks in office to pay farewell visits at home and abroad, here in France. Her current role may be that of a caretaker, but there is plenty to take care of. She'll be keeping political appointments right up to her very last day. At any rate, she seems to be taking pleasure in the prospect of soon leaving politics behind. Okay. Was that yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dann wünsche ich ein schönes Wochenende. Then I wish everybody a great weekend. What do you think, Melinda Crane? Um, where do you see Angela Merkel this time next year? I can tell you where I don't see her. I don't see her going through a revolving door like uh, the one that her predecessor walked through to become Gazprom lobbyist. Uh, I do think that she will use her voice uh, and her authority and, uh, and uh, her great esteem to try to convey messages where they count. We know that she was very close to Barack Obama. I don't see her writing million euro memoirs, but I definitely do see her trying to do what he occasionally does, which is to weigh in on important matters and use that bully pulpit that a former leader does have. So let's talk then about leadership style. Let's talk about uh, her legacy. Um, let's start with a legacy. What, how is she going to be remembered? And let's talk about, as well about, talk as well, if you wouldn't mind, about the, the, the failures as well as the successes. So she's definitely going to go down in history as a consummate crisis manager, but that doesn't mean she didn't make mistakes. And early on in the program, we were talking about that, that critical moment in 2015 when she decided to open the southern border of Germany to nearly a million mostly Middle Eastern and Afghan refugees who had amassed uh, along the border. I personally do not believe that the decision to open the border was a mistake. I think the circumstances were such that it probably was necessary to do it, but there were different approaches that could have been used. She could have connected much more closely with other EU member states. She could have made the point that this was an exception to governing law, governing international law on migration, rather than proof that the uh, Dublin uh, agreement, as it was called, the EU's agreement, simply didn't work. Uh, that did undermine uh, that legal system. And I think the other thing that was a mistake uh, as that crisis developed was not putting enough resources into ensuring that those coping with this influx on the ground would have all the means at their disposal to make sure that the refugees were integrated and, uh, and that this did not become a crisis for the communities where they wound up. But the fact is that six years later, many of these refugees are now well integrated and that, in fact, has uh, played out much as she said it would. She said, we can do it. Uh, so that is one of these crises. The other one is the financial crisis that threatened to tear the EU apart. It did not do so. 
She did manage it in a way that kept uh, things afloat and kept Germany economically stable. What we must never forget is that Germany has remained a very prosperous, mm. stable country throughout her entire chancellorship. Nonetheless, there were very, very hard uh, impacts for the Southern European countries, and many feel that she should have taken greater steps at that time toward the fiscal integration of Europe, including some form of common borrowing capacity. So again, a mistake, but also a legacy. Okay. And well, I think in general, you know, if we look at how she has governed, it has been to take leadership only when she knew that she could bring this country along with her. So even though she is much esteemed in, uh, in other countries, uh, in, in many parts of the world, she always had German interests at the very center of her vision. Yes, well, let's pick up, but well, let's let, let the Chancellor pick that up, uh, which was, this was a theme uh, in her speech, and here's a clip. The many challenges within Germany are also seen in our, what's going on in the rest of the world as well, and not just since the pandemic, because the financial and economic crisis in 2008 and the many people who fled their homes in 2015 have shown how important it is that we work together across national borders, how crucial international institutions and multilateral instruments are in order to tackle the main challenges of our day together. Climate change, digitization, people fleeing their homes, migrations. I would like to encourage you in the future to look at the world from other people's perspectives as well, to perceive the perspectives that the person next to you has, even if it's very different but always to pursue justice. You know what struck me about that part of uh, that speech, uh, Melinda, when she talked uh, about uh, the refugees, she talked about people fleeing their homes. She didn't talk about a crisis. She talked about the people. Indeed. Uh, in the interview that she gave to us, uh, to our colleague Max Hoffman, she also uh, said exactly that. She said she doesn't like to call it a crisis because it's about people, and people are people. And uh, in, in other words, she is trying to express uh, the idea that a mass influx of human beings is not a problem. Um, but of course, it was seen that way by many people in Germany on the right wing of the political spectrum. And there are quite a few who believe that the decision taken in 2015 did wind up creating the space for the alternative for Germany, the right-wing party, uh, to, uh, to uh, gain uh, increasing support and uh, essentially be where it is today, namely in the Bundestag. Um, but that, of course, is the nature of leadership. You take decisions and they have consequences, some of them good, some of them less good. But I think that her leadership style, you talked about that, has been essentially um, not to get way out in front, but to react to events that demand action. So we saw that uh, in the case of the refugees. We saw it in the case of the uh, EU financial crisis. And we saw it in a curious way after Fukushima. Um, and that, again, is a decision that she took to get out of nuclear energy with very wide-reaching uh, consequences to this day. It's viewed as the beginning of energy transformation here in Germany, but this energy transformation has been a very, very rocky one. And by deciding to get out of nuclear, Germany wound up burning more coal and more fossil fuels. Um, that decision didn't necessarily have to be taken, but appears to have been taken partly for political reasons, because there was a very important federal state that was about to hold elections, and there was concern that if, if uh, this decision wasn't taken, that in fact uh, the Christian Democrat could, could lose in that state. So that was an odd uh, crisis decision, but again, one that she decided to take. Well, thank you so much for your uh, insights across uh, this evening. Uh, DW's uh, chief political correspondent, uh, Melinda Crane.
You've been watching a DW News special as we watch the outgoing uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel and her military farewell ceremony. She'll officially hand over power next week after 16 years in office. So here's a look back at some of the musical highlights from tonight's ceremony. Have a good day. Augenradi, aus! Fuck it! Ha! Ah!